describe it uh, pretty well if we assume that the stuff in it just consists of the, the, the usual particles we know of, the standard one. Um, but we need a couple of extra ingredients to, to, to get everything right. Uh, one of those extra ingredients is dark energy. So we, we need to postulate some net energy of space time. This isn't inconsistent with, with the standard model. Um, we just don't know how to predict the value of that background energy. But one thing that we do need that seems to be more particle physics related or potentially particle physics related is dark matter. So again, to, to get a good description of the universe over large scales, um, it needs some fraction of dark energy contributing, some fraction of radiation. And that radiation seems to match up with what you'd expect from photons and neutrinos. Uh, you need some visible matter, and this visible matter is dominated in terms of its energy density, in terms of baryons. So things like hydrogen and helium, stuff we know. But most of the matter, over five times uh, it, the number of baryons we need, uh, should be something else. It should be dark matter, it should be some kind of new matter that doesn't give off light. And, and sort of the, the, the central theme of dark matter is figuring out what that particle is to confirm this dark matter hypothesis that this missing matter really is missing matter, some kind of new particle, and not some modif modification of gravity. So what I'm going to finish up today is talking about how dark matter is distributed uh, through our universe, for one. Um, so through our universe, and specifically through our galaxy, uh, our own galaxy is the case we're most interested in, because that's where, for the most part, we look for dark matter. And from there, I'll move on to, um, to a second topic, change, uh, change gears a little bit, and talk about how you get, uh, how if you postulate a new particle, how you can get a density of dark matter, how this new particle will be left over and give some density of matter in the early universe. So let, let, let me go back to dark matter distributions. So here, again, we, we have a whole long convoluted story where you go from essentially a very, very uniform universe where everything is basically um, about the same density everywhere. And this uniform universe collapses into uh, a much more spotty universe we see today. So in our universe, if you look out, you look in one direction, you don't see anything. You look in another direction, you see stars and galaxies and so on. So a very, very uniform universe has gone to a uh, very patchy universe. Um, it's still uniform if you look over lar large enough regions, but in any small region, um, you might see a star, you might see nothing, so there's a lot of variation. So again, the story is that very small initial variations in the density of dark matter collapse, th collapse on themselves gravitationally. And when those regions collapse gravitationally, they got more dense. And these dense regions formed gravitational potential wells that pulled in the visible matter. The visible matter was pulled in, it collapsed on itself even more, it dumped energy as photons, and it made stars and galaxies and so on. So dark matter, if you like, is a scaffolding upon which everything else forms. And at least on the average, we expect the visible stuff to trace out the density of dark matter. Yes? Yeah, so, so the uh, inhomogeneity of the visible matter um, is thought to be set by this gravitational collapse of the dark matter. But then we have to explain the inhomogeneity of the invisible matter. Yeah, so, so, so the, 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 the variations in, in the visible matter, um, sorry, it, it, so the, the, the variations in the density of the invisible matter, what I'll call it dark matter, um, can, can be explained if you have inflation. So inflation, your universe, your space-time goes through a very rap rapid period of expansion. And this is typically driven by a scalar field. And as a scalar field is driving the expansion, driving the energy density of the universe, it will have small quantum fluctuations. And it turns out that these small quantum fluctuations in the scalar field, the, the inflaton field driving inflation, um, will give you small density variations um, or I guess it's small temperature variations, small, small density variations, they get very, very stretched out. So the spots you see on the cosmic microwave background um, are, are thought to coincide with those fluctuations in the inflaton field. 
So, so for example, the, the fact that the cosmic microwave background for one is very uniform um, is, is one expectation of inflation. But you also expect small deviations from that uniformity from inflation, and that also coincides with what we see in the cosmic microwave background. Now, as far as dark matter goes, those small variations um, are going to lead to small density fluctuations in the density of dark matter. And the regions that are over dense can, as they grow, will become gravitationally unstable and collapse on, on themselves gravitationally. And that pulls in everything else. So, so if, if, if you like, the spots in the CMB um, eventually grow into the very patchy universe we have today. And so they should also just eliminate inhumanity on the visible matter. But I mean, cannot say straight away that that collapses into clumps of visible matter. We need dark matter to facilitate the collapse. Yeah. So, 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 so if if we only had, it, well, there, 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 there are a few things. Um, we, we we see some total matter density, and we see some smaller visible matter density. And the smaller visible matter density. Um, it, it, its actual value can be confirmed from the shape of the cosmic microwave background, the, the sort of bumps and wiggles picture you see. Uh, it can also be confirmed from looking at something called nucleosynthesis. So as the universe cooled, eventually, um, uh, well, as it cooled, the free quarks and gluons bound into nucleons. And if you wait a bit longer, those free nucleons bound into light elements. And if you look at the primordial densities of light elements, um, you, you can compare your predictions with uh, predictions based on nuclear physics with the actual densities you measure. And the only free parameter in that is the total density of baryons, so essentially the total density of visible matter. So it turns out that the value of visible matter you get from the cosmic microwave background is consistent with that value you get from nuclear synthesis. So we're pretty confident in the total density of visible matter. But we know that we need much more matter. So, so it turns out, for example, that this, this collapse of matter to form structures, um, it's very sensitive to when uh, the universe went from being radiation dominated to matter dominated. And this is very sensitive to the total density of matter, for example. So we need much more matter, much more matter than is visible. And, and based on that, you can do simulations of how the structure forms. And if you only put the visible matter in, you don't get the right structure. Whereas if you put the dark matter in, you do get the right structure. So, okay, in any case, we, we have a story about how structure forms. Where's my chalk? Um, and in, in, in general, we think that the dark matter distribution traces the visible matter distribution. So this is useful. And this means that if you want to figure out where to look for dark matter, we should look for dark matter in places that also has a lot of visible matter, more or less. Now, the place we're going to look for dark matter mostly, yes? You said dark matter traces visible matter. Isn't it the other way around? Uh, I, I, yeah, actually, I, that, 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 that's probably a better way of saying it. The, the, the visible matter follows the dark matter in um, today. Okay. So the, the, the place we're mostly going to look for dark matter, though, is in, is in our own galaxy. So our own galaxy, this is, this is the front view. So the, the, this is sort of the, the side view of our galaxy. And the top view of our galaxy is this. So our galaxy is a disk. This is looking head on onto the disk. And this is looking at the disk from the top. So I, I, I've taken some artistic liberties. This actually has sort of spiral arms, and it's more complicated. But for our purposes, just think of it as, as, as a circular disk. And in the middle of the disk, there is uh, a bulge. And we call this the, um, the galactic bulge. Not very creative. Um, the very middle is called the galactic center, or GC. And as far as we're concerned, we're sitting out some distance from the galactic bulge. So we're over here. And uh, so we're over here, and we're orbiting the sun, and the sun is over here. And we're roughly um, nine kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy. The bulge itself is. The radius is roughly two kiloparsecs. And in terms of visible stuff, um, up to the edge of the disk, this is roughly 20-ish kiloparsecs. There's, there's not really a, a hard cutoff, but it's roughly 20 kiloparsecs, just, just to give you, um, just to give you uh, a size of scale. And this whole structure is rotating. 
So uh, I forget if it's going clockwise or counterclockwise. I guess you can just flip which side you're looking at. But this, this whole disk is rotating around the galactic center. And our local speed of rotation relative to the galactic center is roughly, uh, is, is roughly 200 kilometers per second. So it's still non-relativistic, but um, it's still pretty quick. OK, so th th this is the distribution of visible matter in our galaxy. But we also think our galaxy is surrounded by dark matter. And the way we figure out, or the way we try to estimate how dark matter is distributed around our galaxy is we do simulations. And these simulations, uh, as I said, are simple, simple in, in principle, hard in practice. Um, we call them n-body simulations. And th they're just what you would expect from the name. You take a system of n particles, where hopefully n is very large. You let these particles interact with each other through their mutual gravitational interaction. And you just let the system go and evolve. And if you wait long enough, it should reach some kind of steady state. And the steady state that seems to form, and that we expect to, to occur for our galaxy, is that our galaxy, we think, is surrounded by a roughly spherical halo of dark matter. So here's a visible matter. And this whole picture is surrounded by a dark matter halo. And the dark matter in this halo uh, has, a, has a density distribution, and it has a velocity distribution. So the density distribution is, um, is going to be important for us trying to detect dark matter. And what people do with the simulations is when you do a simulation, you, you, you get some distribution, and it's kind of some messy, noisy thing, and you average a bunch of distributions. And people take the results of those distributions, and they write down some parameterized form of the density distribution of dark matter within the halo. So there are a number of possible cases. So I'm just going to give you an example. Um, this probably won't mean, to mean very much to you at the moment, but it's going to be important down the road when we try to look at ways to discover dark matter in our galaxy. Um, but we can parameterize the story in general in terms of some function of the radius away from the galactic center. And I'm going to write it this way. And then here, um, stuff, with, stuff with a circle with a dot in it means the sun. So this is the radius of the sun from the galactic center. This is the local density of dark matter um, in our region. So this local density of dark matter, we think, is roughly 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter. So this is the local energy density of dark matter. So for example, suppose our dark matter is a particle of 100 GeV. That corresponds to uh, an approximate density of roughly one dark matter particle per teacup. So we expect to have dark matter all around us. And if I'm holding a teacup, on the average, there's roughly one dark matter particle in that teacup, assuming it has a mass of about 100 GeV. And this Rs is just the radius, sorry, this uh, our, our sun is this 8.5 kiloparsecs. And this is just the, roughly the distance from the galactic center to, to the location of the sun. And then the rest of the parameters. Um, are just fit to simulations. And different values of the parameters correspond to different attempts to parameterize. And the, these, the, 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 these things are given names. So some of the popular names are um, NFW, INASTO, and um, ISOCAR. So it, 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 again, at this point, this stuff isn't going to mean much, too much to you, but it's going to be important in a little bit. So for example, um, these alpha parameters, um, let me 
35. Um, as far as these parameters go, the important things are the asymptotic behavior far out and the behavior near the origin. So near the origin, um, near the galactic center, this factor goes to 1. And this piece describes the, um, the, the behavior of the dark matter density going towards the galactic center. So for example, for, um, for the NFW profile, uh, NFW stands for Navarro, Frank, and White. Um, the density diverges as r to the minus 1. Whereas for the, the chord profile, I have gamma equals to 0. So this factor, the, the, the density distribution actually asymptotes to a flat profile. And that's where the name core comes in. So, so sometimes people will call a density distribution that goes, that peaks up near the origin, uh, a cusp. Whereas one that goes flat is called a core. Yes? So what, is there a physical interpretation to RS? Um, well, so, so if, if I look at this factor, um, the, the numerator is just a constant, whereas the denominator uh, only kicks in when r is greater than rs. So this factor corresponds to the large distance behavior, the, the large radius behavior. And I think it should be the case that um, when I plug stuff in here, um, this large distance behavior with the gamma should, should roughly fall off as r to the minus 2. And r to the minus 2 corresponds to a flat rotation curve. If, if, if you recall from the last lecture. If, 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 if the mass density falls off as r to the minus 2 second, um, you get a flat rotation curve, and that's what we seem to observe in, in, in most galaxies like ours. So, question? So are alpha, beta, and gamma something that you put in, or is that something that the computation will give you? Ah, uh, so yeah, so, 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 so you should think of these as, as, as simple formulas that try to extract the results of these simulations. So you do simulations, and the simulation data is actually very noisy. So you run a lot of them, and hopefully that noise flattens out. Um, but you, you want to assign some kind of new, easy numerical formula to explain the result of the simulation, and that's where these things come in. And different simulations get slightly different results. Um, one other thing I should mention with the simulations is that, for the most part, these simulations have only included dark matter. Um, but we know that our galaxy also has a lot of baryons. Now, if I'm out here or even in the disk out here, the, the largest density is still going to be dark matter. But if I go to, towards the galactic center, uh, the density of baryons gets really big and actually starts to beat out dark matter. And one question, and one thing people are trying to address right now in these simulations, and there's a whole community of people doing the simulations, is how do we put baryons in here? And it turns out the baryons are much harder to include than dark matter because baryons don't just interact gravitationally. Um, baryons also interact through other stuff. They, they, they can give off radiation. They can collide with each other fairly strongly. And this makes them very hard to simulate. And one, one thing I'll, I'll get to in a second is that this, this picture of a dark matter cusp, where the density diverges towards the origin, um, this might actually be um, something that happens when you don't include baryons. If you put baryons, you could get a different behavior going towards the origin. Um, and and, and it's, 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 it's still a question what exactly that behavior is. Okay. But in any case, I mentioned this to you so you have an idea of, of, of what the density distribution looks like, because this will be important for uh, a lot of the searches for dark matter I'll talk about. There's another thing, though. In, and that other thing is that the dark matter particles within this halo, they're not just sitting there. These dark matter particles are whizzing around. They're still non-relativistic, but they have a velocity distribution. So this velocity distribution, so this is, this is, this is a, the density distribution. They also have a velocity distribution. And we'll be most interested in the velocity distribution where we are. And the velocity distribution where we are, um, again, people write down a form that, that tries to match what you get in these n-body simulations. Uh, the form I'm writing down isn't fundamental in any way. It's just a parameterization of the n-body results. Um, but the, the, the form that people usually write down looks a bit like um, a Maxwell distribution for a, an ideal gas. Okay. 
Okay, so this is the typical velocity distribution. Um, sometimes people use other forms, but this is, this is generically the form they will have. And for these velocity distributions, um, a typical V0, which characterizes, if you like, a, a mean dark matter velocity, is roughly um, 220 kilometers per second. Or if I normalize this to the speed of light, this is roughly 10 to the minus 3. So the, 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 the picture of the velocity distribution, f of v, so if, if, if I draw the density distribution, let me just So if I, if, if I draw these distributions, I have r, the row of r, I'm going towards the origin. Um, it goes like 1 over r, and then typically falling off, it goes like 1 over r squared far, far out. I also have this f of e. which in this case only depends on the magnitude of the, of the velocity vector. And in this case, I have, a, um, I have some Gaussian distribution. And this, this Gaussian distribution is just some, some, some falling Gaussian with a cutoff. So, 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 so if you like the width of this Gaussian, roughly it corresponds to v0. And there's also a cutoff. So the theta function here, the theta function here is just a step function. So remember, um, a step function, theta of x, is equal to 1 for x greater than 0 and a 0 for x less than 0. So the idea of the theta function here is it cuts off the velocity at some upper value. And a typical value of the escape velocity here, this, this v s, is roughly 600 kilometers per second. So this is roughly um, 600 kilometers per second. This V0 is more like 200. And the reason why we cut this distribution off is that if I have a dark matter particle in our galaxy that's moving too fast, this dark matter particle can just leave the galaxy. So our galaxy has, ha, has some potential well, and there's also corresponding um, escape velocity from that potential well. And the escape velocity for where we are um, is roughly 600 kilometers per second. So we expect that dark matter going past the 600 kilometers per second is just going to escape the galaxy. So that's why we put in this theta function. And then the normalization factor, n, is just so that if I integrate this f of v over all v's, um, I get 1. In the sense that um, I want to have d3v f of v equal to 1. And I use this to fix the, 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 the normalization n. But um, the coupling n is roughly equal to 1 because the escape velocity is much larger than the typical velocity. So the Gaussian is, is very small as, as I go out. Yes? Is like v minus v escape reverse on the function? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I guess I have a typo on my notes. So, 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 so let me just give you an idea of where this stuff is going to be interesting. Um, one way to look for dark matter is that we have dark matter in our galaxy. And dark matter, matter in our galaxy can sometimes collide with itself and annihilate. And when dark matter collides with itself and annihilates, it gives off visible, par visible particles. And those visible particles we can see as cosmic rays. So one source of cosmic rays, of high energy cosmic rays, could be dark matter annihilation. And to compute the rates of those, uh, of those cosmic rays, to, to, compute the dark, to compute the dark matter induced cosmic ray flux, uh, we need to know what the density of dark matter is in our galaxy. And we're especially interested in what the density of dark matter is near the origin. Because this is where the density of dark matter is largest. And, and we're going to see that the rate of dark matter annihilation is proportional to the square of the dark matter density. So this distribution is really important for estimating dark matter signals from annihilation. Um, and the look for with, with cosmic ray telescopes. This distribution, this f of e, is going to be really important for looking dark, for dark matter directly. 
And the way we look for dark matter directly is we, we take some very sensitive experimental apparatus, uh, we shield it from, from background radiation, and we wait for a dark matter particle to come in, scatter off a nucleus within our, uh, within our apparatus. And what this looks like is you have an apparatus that's very shielded, and naively you expect nothing to happen. But if dark matter comes in, um, collides with the nucleus into the apparatus, you'll see the nucleus recoil. So the signal of dark matter in these direct dark matter searches is you see nucle nuclei in your apparatus recoiling for no good reason. So again, th th this, there's a whole industry of people doing this. Um, there, there, there's snow lab near here uh, where, where a lot of these experiments are taking place. And again, if you put these experiments very deep underground, you shield them from uh, a lot of backgrounds. But it's going to turn out that the velocity of dark matter around us, this f of e, is going to be important for, for calculating the rates of that kind of scattering. So the faster the dark matter particle comes in, uh, the bigger the recoil you're going to get in your apparatus. So this distribution is going to be important for looking for dark matter directly. This distribution is going to be important for looking for dark matter so-called indirectly from its annihilation products. Okay, but in any case, this is how dark matter, this is how we think dark matter is distributed, um, <coughs> particularly within our, within our galaxy. Um, but, the, but the story of dark matter within our galaxy also dovetails into our story of dark matter being distributed over the whole universe, in starting with a very uniform distribution and then forming clumps through its gravitational self interaction so in the last class, I, I spoke about evidence for dark matter. Uh, I, I've spoken about how we think dark matter contributes to the so-called structure in the universe, why, why we think it's, 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 very, it's very patchy. The last thing I want to uh, mention before, before going on to talk more about dark matter, just to give you the, the full story, is to mention a few challenges to our dark matter hypothesis. And, and, and this is for purposes of full disclosure. Um, but having said that, the dark matter hypothesis, which is a very simple one, that there just exists a new, neutral, stable particle, um, does a great job explaining all kinds of data. It, it, it can explain the, the galactic rotation data. It can explain things like the bullet cluster. It can explain galaxy clusters. Uh, matches up the cosmic microwave background. And... Um, and this very simple assumption seems to work very well over a broad range of data. So we have a lot of confidence in it, uh, but there are a few cases where it doesn't seem to work so well. Now, these cases, um, none of them are definitive, and none of them are de definitive because uh, I'd say in all cases, the theoretical uncertainties are large enough that it could just be that we don't quite fully understand what's going on. And we're not fully able to, to predict what dark matter really does in, in, in a very precise way. But I, just, I, do, I do want to mention these um, in passing. So the first challenge um, I'm going to men mention is the so-called um, missing satellite problem. And this missing satellite problem is actually closely tied to these n-body simulations. So when people do n-body simulations, um, they see dark matter go from, from, from a uniform initial state into a very clumpy final state. And the clumpy final state has some net density distribution that looks like the function I, I, I wrote. And it has some velocity distribution. But it also has what's called substructure. And what I mean by substructure is that it's found that in these, um, in these simulations, um, small clumps of dark matter form first, and these small clumps then clump into larger clumps. And so you, you form small clumps, and then these guys come together, and, they, and, and, and then they, they clump into a, into a bigger clump, and then you get bigger clumps, and, and so on. But at the end of the day, instead of just having a uniform sphere of dark matter with some smooth density uh, profile, um, it's actually somewhat patchy. And it has substructure in the sense that instead of just being some smooth distribution, there are actually subclumps within the bigger um, galactic halo. So what you can um, what you can do is write down something called a mass function. So suppose I look at the relative abundance 
of clumps of a given mass. Um, so I look at the, 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 the distribution of clumps of mass within my, within my bigger spherical uh, profile. And then there's some falling function. So the idea is that um, we have more so-called substructure, even within our galactic halo, made of small clumps, than we do at, on, on the large end. So the puzzle here, though, is that these simulations predict a fair bit of so-called um, small satellites. T. And the way to think of a small satellite is is that besides our galactic halo, where things are somewhat uniform, things have clumped together, we should also have smaller um, sub-halos around. So this is our main dark matter halo. We also expect to have sub-halos. And astronomers have gone and tried to look for sub-halos. And a sub-halo is just going to look like, uh, if you like, a mini subversion of our galaxy with fewer stars and fewer mass. And some of these are seen, but less of these are seen than one would expect from the dark matter simulations. So the problem is that compared to the dark matter simulations, not enough are seen. Now, this, I'm guessing, so my, my, my best guess for this is that the reason why we don't see as many of these um, it isn't that they're not there, it's just that we're, they're hard to see. And, and at least the, the leading explanation for this with, um, within the dark matter par paradigm is that these um, so-called subhalos, these so-called uh, satellites, um, the explanation that is still, well, it's still under review. We're, we're not quite sure how to do this because remember the end body simulations don't include visible matter. They don't include baryons. <coughs> but the conjecture is that when you form a, a small subhalo, it doesn't do a very good job at pulling visible matter into it. Whereas the bigger halo um, d d d does a much better job. So the idea here <coughs> is that if these subhalos don't collect visible matter, then we can't see them with our telescopes. So this missing satellite problem might not actually be a problem. It might just be that we're not able to see these small sub-satellites, these small halos, because they don't pull in as much visible matter. So this, is, this has been put forward as, as, a, as a problem for dark matter. Um, it might not actually be a problem. A second proposal, though, is that maybe dark matter isn't completely non-relativistic. Maybe you have two dark matter species, where one dark matter species is um, uh, one dark matter species is fully non-relativistic, but you also have a subcomponent that is not quite completely non-relativistic. So the terminology here is um, a particle that's, that's very non-relativistic <coughs> is, is said to be cold. Um, one that is relativistic is said to be hot. And the proposal for this is, um, is, is a dark matter particle that's semi-relativistic. So let's say kind of order 0.1 C. And these semi-relativistic objects are said to be warm. And if you have some warm dark matter in your galaxy, what can happen is that um, cold dark matter clumps very well gravitationally precisely because it doesn't have a, a huge velocity that um, essentially has very little kinetic energy, so it just gets pulled into the gravitational potential wells. On the other hand, if I have some dark matter particles that have a lot of large velocity, um, this large velocity means that they can escape the potential wells, and you don't form the structures efficiently. And what can happen in this case is that in the regions where you have um, an overdensity and you're forming the small halos, the warm dark matter can escape, and wash out that structure. So you just don't form the small halos. So, 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 so two of the explanations for this missing satellite problem are that first of all, 
the missing satellites really are there, we just can't see them. A second uh, proposed explanation is that there could be a component of dark matter that's not entirely non-relativistic, that's so-called warm, that's, that's actually destroying this small structure. Um, on the other hand, if your dark matter is only semi-relativistic, it can only travel so far, and that means that it's not able to wash out large structures. Just because it, 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 to wash out a large structure, it has to escape from it, and if it's not traveling too, too fast, it just doesn't have enough time to get out of the large structure, but it does have enough time to get out of a small structure and to destroy that structure. So, so that means that if, if I had warm dark matter, my mass function would have some cutoff from the free streaming. From, I, I'd have some cutoff where o, over some distance, the warm dark matter could get out of this potential well and wash it out. So I'm, going to, I, 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 I'm not going to worry about this uh, much going forward. I'm going to implicitly assume that these subhalos are there, but we just can't see them. Either that, or, or, or maybe we don't fully understand the n-body simulations. But in any case, um, this, is, this is a bit of a puzzle, but I don't think it's, it, it's not one that's serious enough, serious enough to give up on the dark matter hypothesis. Actually, for the second one, I'm, I'm going to go back to, to, to this. So the second puzzle is called the cusp core problem. And that is that if you look at other galaxies, if you look at other galaxies or, or even um, other subgalaxies, uh, instead of having a dark matter density distribution that has the cusp, the divergence is 1 over r, and this divergence is what you seem to get from these n-body simulations. Instead, what happens is it seems to have a core in the sense that it, it asymptotes to something that doesn't diverge, but instead to something that flattens out. So this, this divergence is sometimes called a dark matter um, cusp. And if it flattens out, you say it has a core. And observationally, other galaxies seem to have something closer to a core than a cusp, whereas a cusp is what you expect from these n-body simulations. Um, here, I'm guessing that the issue is just that we don't fully understand, first of all, the n-body simulations, but also the baryons. So, remember, at, at the center of a galaxy, where this kind of cusp core issue is a problem, um, we expect to have large baryonic densities, but these n-body simulations, at least until very re recently, These n-body simulations don't have baryons in them. And these baryons, this visible matter, is very important near the center of galaxies. And um, only very recently have, have these simulations started to include baryons. Again, it's very difficult. It's hard to do in a self-consistent way. But it, it's looking, at least initially, like if you put baryons into the n-body simulations, you, you can get rid of this cusp. So again, this cusp core problem probably actually isn't a problem. It looks like it's more an issue of how we simulate dark matter and how we understand the dark matter dynamics with the visible matter. So that's the second challenge. Um, the third one is a bit more speculative. And the third one um, has to do with, um, it has to do with rotating circular galaxies. And I'll call it the baryonic Tully Fisher. find my notes. It's called the baryonic Tully fisher relation. Or BTF. And what's going on here is that um, there's a wide class of circular galaxies. So our, our galaxy isn't circular. Our, 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 our galaxy is a, is a spiral galaxy. Um, and it's a flat disk. But there are other galaxies that uh, have a slightly different morphology but are also seem to be rotating. And for these rotating galaxies, um, what, what is seen observationally is that the total baryonic mass within these galaxies seems to match some relation um, of this form. So this is the total baryonic mass in the galaxy. 
This is a measure of the rotational, um, the, the average rotational velocity of that circular galaxy. And this A and this X coefficient are obtained from fits to the data. So this is just an empirical relation. It's, it's not predicted by theory. It's just coming out of experiment. And observationally, people seem to see um, X of, um, x to the fourth, and a of about 50 times the mass of the sun per m minus four, second, second to the four. Okay, but anyway, these are, these, are, these are just things obtained from a fit. And this fit, um, if I plot mb versus vc, um, this relation implies um, a straight line on, on a log-log scale. So I guess I'll, I'll put log here and log here. And if I plot the data on the scale, the data are found to match up really well with this line. Now, the reason this is a, this is a bit of a puzzle is that this velocity is driven by the amount of matter you have in the galaxy. And we think that most of the matter in the galaxy is dark matter, not baryonic matter. Whereas this is, the, this is only the mass of baryonic matter. So we expect that this should be driven by the total matter, so baryons plus dark matter. Whereas this relation seems to work very well if I only put the baryonic matter here. And so the, the, the point is the data falls very, very closely to the line you, you would get from this relation. But on the other hand, we expect that different galaxies have different um, dark matter structures and that in, in different relative baryon fractions. So, so some, some galaxies are, are expected to have a larger fraction of baryons and some expected to have a less, a smaller fraction of baryons relative to dark matter. So what we would at least naively expect from, um, for, 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 from, from dark matter relations is much more of a, a spread compared to what's seen. So the, the puzzle that the baryonic Tully, Tully Fisher relation is that the data seems to match up to this line better than you would at least naively expect for uh, galaxies dominated by dark matter, which is what would happen under a dark matter hypothesis. Now, there's been a fair bit of controversy over this in the literature. Um, simulations with baryons uh, are starting to actually get these points a bit closer to the line. Um, the people who are pushing this as a problem for cold dark matter um, the, the, the people who are pushing this as a problem for cold dark matter, other people have come along and criticized their analysis. So other people have come along and said that, okay, what you're putting in here really isn't actually the total matter, amount of matter in, in baryons. You're missing a whole bunch of hot gas. Uh, and this doesn't actually work nearly as well. Or you're, you're cherry picking your data so that it does fit on the line. Um, but but if, if, if this does pan, pan out, this has also been put forward as a uh, motivation for modified gravity. So if I have modified gravity in, in no dark matter, um, well, it turns out that people can modify gravity such that you fix gravitational rotation curves. But with modified gravity, uh, you'd also expect a relation like this. And that if I don't have dark matter, the only thing that should matter in terms of matter is the baryonic matter. And, um, so, so, so people have, have, have pitched this as, as a motivation for modified gravity instead of dark matter. Uh, I think it's still too much too early to say. Um, the, data, the data is still a bit messy. Our understanding of dark matter within galaxies is still a bit messy. Um, so it, it's, it's an interesting thing to, to keep an eye on, but at this point, I'm not willing to sign off on it as, as, as a really strong problem for the dark matter hypothesis. So I'm going to move on now. And for the rest of the class, uh, I'm going to concentrate on uh, the dark matter case, where I'm going to assume that the dark matter consists of a new particle. Um, and I'm going to look at, for, well, first of all, what dynamics it implies, but also talk about ways uh, in which I might discover it, and also various specific dark matter particle candidates based on theories that extend the standard model. All right. Okay. So, so th th this kind of wraps up my initial introduction for motivation for dark matter 
evidence for it and possible issues with the dark matter hypothesis. The thing I want to move on to next is actually figuring out how to calculate if I have a dark matter particle, how do I predict its density in the early universe? So if I have this particle and it's floating around in the cosmological plasma, what density is it going to end up with today? How do I get the, how do I get the matter density out of this new particle? Because depending on the properties of the particle, I might expect to have lots of it in the universe today. I might expect to have very little of it. Uh, but I have to have just the right amount to explain the, the, the missing matter in terms of dark matter. So the next topic I want to get onto is so-called thermal dark matter creation. And for this, um, we're going to go back to uh, we're going to go go back to stuff that you, you you would have seen in your cosmology course, and we're going to talk about thermodynamics in the early universe, and also deviations from that thermodynamic picture. So the the picture of thermodynamics you've seen for the early universe implicitly assumes that stuff is in thermodynamic equilibrium. Now it's going to turn out that the story for dark matter. Uh, the, the interesting part, the, the density of dark matter we're going to get, is going to require a, a departure from thermodynamic equilibrium. So our picture for thermal dark matter creation is we're going to start with a dark matter particle in equilibrium with the cosmological plasma. So it's, it's floating around, and it, it's, it's, its distributions are just equilibrium distributions, and we know how to calculate its density. But uh, as the universe expands and cools, this dark matter particle is going to fall out of thermodynamic equilibrium, and it's going to leave over some abundance it's actually much larger than what we would expect from equilibrium abundance. And this leftover dark matter abundance uh, is sometimes called a relic density. And this leftover abundance, in some cases, it, it has just the right value to give us what we want for dark matter. Okay. So because I'm going to talk about equilibrium uh, and departures from it, let me just remind you of some stuff um, that, will, that will hopefully be a, a review. So I'm going to start with talking about equilibrium, and then I'll get to non-equilibrium, or ways to compute departures from it. OK, so we're going to start off with um, thermodynamic equilibrium. And the reason this is useful is that we think that the universe, at least at some point early in its history, was a hot soup of particles. And in this hot soup of particles, um, everything's bouncing around and colliding and who knows what. We can't really say what each individual particle is doing, but in this situation, we can say what particles are doing on the average. So this brings us to statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. And because we're going to talk about elementary particles, um, because these particles aren't interacting too strongly, uh, we can treat them to a pretty good approximation as free particles that sometimes interact with each other. And in this case, um, we can describe the average properties of any particle species by distribution functions. So suppose I have a, a kind of particle. I'm going to label it by i. The average properties of that particle species, on the average, can be described by some distribution function f of uh, x, p, and t. And this distribution function, um, I guess in principle, this distribution function could also have information about the specific spin state of the particle or its specific um, color state. But um, I, I'm going to hide that information. Um, this distribution function, if you like, is a probability density for a given particle at time t to be a position x and momentum p. So again, we're, we're treating these things as, as free particles bouncing around. Um, so they have some net position and some momentum. And given this distribution function, we can compute average values. So for example, the mean number density, so I'll go over here to do it. In terms of the distribution function, the number density um, as a function of time and position is just defined as the, the integral over momentum, um, and the gi, fi tx p, where this gi is uh, the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, 
And what, what I mean by degrees of freedom is things like different spin states or different color states or so on. Um, so th this, this, th this, is, this is the number density at a given time and position. Um, this is a given energy density, rho i of t and x, and this is just d3p, 2 pi cubed, gi, and then here I put the energy as a function of p times fi tx p. And finally, I can talk about the partial pressure. So the partial pressure at time t of x, the partial pressure is just a contribution of that single particle species to the total pressure. So the total pressure is just the sum of the partial pressures of all the species. So for example, if I think of the pressure in the room, the total pressure of the room has some contribution from the oxygen in the air and the nitrogen in the air. And the nitrogen gives one contribution, the oxygen gives another contribution, and together these give the total pressure. But I can also talk about the partial pressures of each individual contribution. And it turns out that the formula for this, E3P, 2 pi cubed, GI, and here what goes, sorry, this should be um, P squared over 3 E of P, FI, T, XP. Where again, the I is the label for the particle species. So for example, I could do this for a photon or an electron or uh, I don't know, a helium atom or, or what have you. But uh, of course, I'm going to be most interested when this label corresponds to the dark matter particle. OK, so the story in equilibrium, well, the story in general, even away from equilibrium, is that I can describe the properties of the system on the average in terms of distribution functions. So the distribution function, whether or not I'm in equilibrium, I still have a, a description in terms of distribution functions. But in equilibrium, I'm going to have a very specific form for the, for the distribution function, which in this case is going to be the grand canonical ensemble. Yeah. Does anybody know how to print double-sided here? Fantastic. Maybe I'll talk to you after. Okay, so again, distribution functions apply whether or not I'm in equilibrium, as long as I have enough to talk about average properties. Um, but equilibrium. For us, um, e equilibrium is going to correspond to the grand canonical ensemble. So in the grand canonical ensemble, we have um, this thing, even though in principle it can depend on time, x, and position, it only, in the grand canonical ensemble, depends on the energy, which is a function of momentum. And this is the usual familiar um, E minus mu i um, over ti minus plus 1 to the minus 1. So this ti corresponds to the effective temperature of that species. In principle, I could have, um, I, 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 could, I could have one species with its own equilibrium with one temperature and a different species that's not talking to the first species at a different equilibrium with a different temperature. Um, so I, I'm going to allow different temperatures. This, of course, is a chemical potential which corresponds to an average number density. And the minus plus one correspond to, co correspond to both Einstein or Fermi distributions. So the minus corresponds to, to Bose, and the plus corresponds to Fermi. Um, and you, you, you should think of the temperature and the chemical potential as things that I turn to give me um, the average, to, to give me the right energy density or the right number density. So in equilibrium, th these are going to be our distribution functions. And equilibrium is actually a bit of a slippery concept. Um, 
I, I don't know if, if any of you, how familiar with various of you are, are for, with history of physics, um, but there seems to be this, this unfortunate correlation between people who think really hard about equilibrium and statistical mechanics and thermodynamics with, with people who also have serious mental health issues. And um, I, 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 no, it probably isn't a correlation. It's probably, but, um, but, but, but I do want to say that thinking about very hard about equilibrium, um, actually defining equilibrium is a very, very slippery concept. And um, really doing it in a rigorous way, way I don't want to say it can drive you crazy, but um, sometimes it's best just not to think too hard about it. Let's say. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, 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 uh, for example, if, if you go and read about Boltzmann, it's, um, he did great work, but he also had various, various issues. Anyway, so back to equilibrium. Um, I'm, I'm going to take the loose definition of equilibrium as um, the state of the system, so the state uh, a system would reach if it's left for an infinitely long time. So so, 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 so for example, suppose I start with um, the air in the room, and suppose I took all the air molecules and I forced them kind of over into that corner. If I leave those air molecules to sit around long enough, uh, eventually they're going to spread out through the room and, and, and spread out and have some distribution function that corresponds to, to a net temperature. Um, this definition, though, isn't quite entirely rigorous. Because, for example, suppose I had a system of, let's say, some perfectly bouncy balls in a box. And these perfectly bouncy balls in the box could bounce off the walls of the box, but they never actually interacted with each other. In this case, I could actually set up a system where I start with, with, with all the balls in the box, and I throw them all towards the wall at the same time all together, and they just bounce back and forth infinitely long. This wouldn't actually be uh, an equilibrium situation. What I need for equilibrium, also secretly, is additional interactions between those balls in the box so they start bouncing around and randomize and so on. So sort of secretly hidden in this, in the infinitely long time, is also interactions between the stuff in the system to drive it towards equilibrium. Again, I'm starting to ramble on here, and I don't want to talk too much about equilibrium, but there's a lot going on here. And I think just trying to have a good um, intuitive picture of stuff interacting with themselves and relaxing to some steady state um, is a good way to think about equilibrium for what we're going to do. OK. so now. We're working with the grand canonical ensemble. The grand canonical ensemble corresponds specifically to a system, uh, a small system, that's in equilibrium with a much bigger reservoir, where it can exchange energy and it can exchange particles with that bigger reservoir, such that the total energy of the system plus reservoir and the total number of particles in the system plus reservoir is conserved. Um, this, is this is appropriate for the cosmological plasma, because the system I tend to study is a, a small confined region that can interact with the rest of the, the cosmological plasma, or at least the rest of the Hubble volume. And this idea of exchange of particles and energy makes sense for that. So in our cosmological system, our equilibrium is going to be defined by a grand canonical ensemble system. Um, now, when I talk about equilibrium, again, even in my very loose definition, I have this infinitely long time thing. Um, OK, I guess I'm, I'm out of time, but let me just say quickly, and I'll come back to this tomorrow that um, to think about equilibrium, I don't actually need an infinitely long time. I just need to have the interactions that drive my system towards the equilibrium to be a lot faster than the time scale of the system. And this is going to be important for cosmology, because in cosmology, we don't have an infinite amount of time. The universe is expanding. Um, it's always changing a little bit. Um, and it's, it's also not infinitely old. So the universe is never actually going to reach equilibrium in this sense. But you can have stuff reach effectively equilibrium in the early universe if the stuff that drives it to equilibrium is a lot faster than the rate of expansion of the universe. So what we're going to see is that often when we talk about stuff in equilibrium in the early universe, we don't have an infinitely long time. It's just the stuff that drives it to equilibrium happens much, much faster than the, the, the age of the universe. So stuff is basically, for all intents and purposes, in equilibrium, even though it's not quite precisely exactly in equilibrium from this definition. 
So I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I guess see you tomorrow.